Audio's good? Okay, so I'm Three Alarm Lamp Scooter, and uh, today I'm giving a talk on DIY nuke proofing. So show of hands real quick, anyone here try to come to this talk last year? Anyone? Anyone? Got a few, okay. Anyone spotted as a fed in the spot the fed panel that uh, replaced this talk last year? <laughs> okay, I guess no one's that brave. So anyways, <laughs> uh, got a little, little background radiation, I guess you'd say, as far as uh, motivations for this. I originally submitted this talk to the CFP uh, with some outstanding questions as to what exactly I could and couldn't discuss. Uh, there was actually some information in this talk that was previously classified, but it's uh, since been published in an open access journal. And uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't deliver that content last year as it had not yet been published. And uh, now I'm you know, not afraid of ending up in Gitmo to discuss it. That info specifically is uh, third generation laser isotope separation technology. In addition to that, unfortunately, there was some tritium illicitly imported for the black badges last year. And uh, also, I was warned, you know, don't, don't get caught up in that. So I guess that's, that's a little bit of our background. I'm really trying to keep this fast because we've only got like, what, 10 minutes or whatever. Anyways, so we're just going to talk about physics a little bit uh, as we move into DIY nuke proofing. Uh, there's kind of more fear, uncertainty, and doubt surrounding nuclear weapons than uh, perhaps any other technology out there, especially their hypothetical capabilities in electronic warfare. Of course, DEF CON is a computer security conference, and nuclear weapons have fortunately, for the most part, not done much physical damage in the last seven decades outside of some Cold War accidents. However, DEF CON did originally stand for defense condition, and I think it's a valuable forum to look at how the confluence of factors and technologies are uh, causing what I euphemistically refer to as a changing threat landscape on the nuclear side. Uh, so to really grok the gestalt of nuclear weapons and the threat landscape uh, that has been there in the past, uh, we kind of have to go back to a little quick remedial physics lesson. You've got uh, two different main isotopes of uranium, uranium-230. Uh, well, okay, let me try and speak up a little bit more. So we're going to have a, uh, like a 90 second remedial physics lesson here, if my microphone can work properly. <laughs> We've got two different isotopes of uranium that are kind of important to all this. One of them is uranium-235, the other is uranium-238. They uh, differ by three neutrons, and that is why they have differing mass. And uh, kind of the real short version of this I had a lot more prepared, but you can use what's called the kinetic isotope effect to separate uh, the, higher, the lighter from the heavier uranium. And uh, the lighter uranium-235 actually is what's called fissile material. If you hit it with a neutron, it can sustain a nuclear reaction if it's enriched above around 5% usually, uh, unless it's a you know, pressurized light water reactor. Uh, anyways, the, uh, the heavier uranium isotope is much more stable, has about a four and a half billion year half-life, whereas the uh, lighter uranium isotope is about 700 million years. And uh, if you manage to get about a 57 kilogram ball of this lighter isotope separated out of the heavy stuff that's naturally occurring, 99.7 or sorry, 99.3% of natural uranium, you can, uh, you can actually make a, a physics package, as they euphemistically call uh, a nuclear weapons uh, with, again, about 57 kilograms as a minimum uh, for the 235 content. Uh, interestingly, uh, uranium-238 is also not just an inert filler. You can actually hit it with a neutron, and it will undergo uh, transmutation to plutonium-239, which is also fissile material. It actually has about a uh, 10 kilogram critical mass. That translates to about the size of a baseball. Uh, but you need a nuclear reactor that's running to do that, so that is a very difficult thing for uh, anything but uh, really a nation state actor to do. Whereas, as I'll get to, this U-235 uh, route to a, a physics package is becoming more practical for a potential proliferator. So moving on a little bit more, uh, we kind of had the original proliferation was, uh, was really the United States and the Manhattan Project back around World War II. And I really, again, won't touch on too much here. I'll just try and go with the very basics. But kind of the one on the, uh, the device on the right there was called Fat Man. That was a plutonium implosion style device. Again, you need a nuclear reactor to build that. Uh, pretty difficult to come up with the plutonium. Uh, you also need explosive lensing because plutonium is uh, naturally liable to kind of go off ahead of time, whereas uranium isn't. Uh, you need to slam several pieces of the plutonium together at very high speed, and that's also something that's non-trivial with explosives engineering. The one on the left, uh, Little Boy, which was dropped on uh, Hiroshima versus Fat Man, was dropped on, uh, on Nagasaki. Uh, the one on the left is much, much easier to build. Uh, again, as I'll get to because of third generation laser isotope separation. Uh, so moving on again real quick, and I'm skipping over so much content that I wanted to get into. Essentially the USSR, you know, where Soviet Russia at the time, ripped off uh, the US's design. They had a spy named Klaus Fuchs in the Manhattan Project. He turned over a lot of diagrams and uh, information on the US's R&D in the Manhattan Project over to the Rosenbergs who were 
subsequently electrocuted for their spying by the U.S. And uh, then the USSR made uh, RDS-1, or Stalin's jet engine, and that kind of really got the Cold War into, uh, into overdrive, you could say. Um, so anyways, moving on from there, uh, there was, of course, further R&D in nuclear weapons, and this is honestly not super-duper relevant to the presentation either. There were what were called teller ulam devices, which is where you have a nuclear fusion reaction going on near a fission reaction. And uh, again, that actually requires a hydrogen isotope called tritium that's quite rare. And there have not been any big breakthroughs recently in, in producing or uh, in uh, separating tritium out from regular hydrogen. So that's, again, not super duper relevant other than, you know, the largest fireworks out there, essentially. Char Sar Bomba was, uh, I believe, over 50 megaton detonation that the USSR did. Ah, uh, so moving on again. <laughs> uh, there were a lot of other countries that, you know, proliferated, and uh, there was the UK, France, China, India, Pakistan, etc. I kind of called them all the nuclear also rands. Most of them didn't do anything too uh, necessarily innovative. Uh, but one of the big exceptions to that, which was interesting from a strategy perspective, and I'll get into strategy again, uh, again in a second, is uh, Israel. And they've officially maintained nuclear ambiguity. Uh, supposedly, they might have set off a nuke in 1979 called the, the Vela Incident somewhere in the uh, whew, you know, exact sea slipping. But anyways, the Vela Incident in 19, 1979 was supposedly a test of theirs, but they don't confirm or deny that they have nuclear weapons. So all outside sources have that kind of graph on the right there as a, uh, as a probability distribution of how much plutonium they likely have with you know, a low end there and the uh, 500 kilogram range and a high end and the 900 kilogram range. And that's, uh, that's kind of that. And then on the left, you kind of see this graph of uh, you know the stockpile of the world over time. And the US and the USSR were essentially engaged in a kind of deadlock race to try and get the most nuclear weapons up until there was a change in strategy that I'll get to in a second. And then that kind of came down. And then over time, you had these other countries emerging and, uh, and also joining the nuclear club. So here are three people who I think were really central to kind of that graph we saw previously. The, uh, the first one is John von Neumann. And the really interesting thing that he did is he came up with what was called mutually assured destruction, which was sort of the idea that as long as you've got two superpowers that are perpetually locked in a, uh, you know, a cold war, essentially, that they will never nuke each other because they're afraid of getting blown up by the other. And uh, he kind of said, you know, the only way you can keep a, a strategy like that going is you have to have a massive response of being able to obliterate the other side, no limited response of just, you know, tit for tat. Uh, and that was a, a bit of an interesting strategy at the time. Fortunately, nuclear war obviously never happened. But one of the guys who was really uh, instrumental in changing that strategy and I'd say led to a lot of those stockpile reductions over time was Herman Kahn. And he argued uh, rather controversially in his book on thermonuclear war, which was rather famously parodied by Stanley Kubrick as Dr. Strangelove, uh, the concept of winnability, which is controversial, but I wouldn't say he looked as much at that as, uh, as really, you know, how you can make it a little more survivable. Uh, and what he essentially concluded, and quite controversially, was that extensive fortification, anti-ballistic missile, and related defense technologies uh, were not the only way of looking at a massive retaliatory response, uh, or as he called it, a wargasm. You could uh, end up having a tremendous amount of over-targeting, where Moscow ends up, you know, pointing a dozen warheads at a hot dog stand at the Pentagon, <laughs> or vice versa. Uh, but his thinking was certainly heard in Moscow, too. They excavated M2, a second clandestine subway for the Soviet leadership. Kennedy also looked at a, a bunker at 1.2, but that was never built under Washington. Uh, and then the third guy on the right there is quite interesting, uh, Abdul Qadir Khan, and he was essentially the first state agnostic uh, proliferator of nuclear technology, and he pretty much just spread it around everywhere. I won't get into too much, but he uh, was called the father of Pakistan's nuclear program, but he really proliferated to a lot of other countries, including North Korea and Iran, and he, he originally worked for Urenko in the Netherlands, and he developed an uh, improved version of uh, centrifuge to separate out uranium, and then he just went and dealt it essentially to the highest bidder. <laughs> uh, so let's move on again. Uh, yeah, so one of the big things, my slides are a little out of order here, <laughs> uh, but one of the big things really with re-examining this threat model uh, is not necessarily looking at much, as much as a uh, full-out nuclear war is perhaps uh, maybe an EMP, uh, EMP event. And that is something that was learned to a large degree during U.S. testing uh, back in the 50s and 60s, there was the, uh, the Starfish, Starfish Prime shot, which took out about a, 
a third of the satellites uh, orbiting the planet at the time, and this was, uh, you know, well up into the exosphere. This is not a detonation down near the ground. And uh, what it does essentially is it ionizes the plasma in the upper atmosphere, ionizes the gas in the upper atmosphere into plasma, and uh, that leads to a Compton current where a very large amount of electrons are all coming downward, and then you have relatively broadband radiation down from the very low frequency ELF side all the way up to, uh, you know, mid-range microwave, a few, up to a few gigahertz, uh, all projected by the ZMP. And of course, this would be uh, quite catastrophic, potentially, to electronics. If you see a map here of just a, an EMP over South Dakota, you know, a few hundred miles up, you can have voltage strengths of, you know, 5,000 to 50,000 volts per meter in some of these bands. You know, the red one there is 50,000, the uh, kind of turquoise-ish is, is more 5,000. And, uh, you know, obviously you need shielding for that, so this is something that the U.S. government and military has been pretty proactive about ever since the Starfish Prime test, but the civilian sector's really been lagging behind. And, uh, oh my goodness, I'm running out of time already. Let me run into this much longer. Oh, I guess there are no greens around. Anyways. <laughs> uh, so, when you think about a uh, disproportionate risk for high-altitude EMP, uh, you really think of maybe a non-state actor more even than necessarily a state wanting to do something like this. I mean, it would be a tremendously devastating attack from an economic perspective. I'm waiting for a hook any minute, by the way. Uh, but, uh, oh dear. Uh, yeah. In terms of a hypothetical day-to-day -day life post-EMP, really the industries that would be hardest hit is anything that relies on a just-in-time supply chain. So in terms of goods and, goods and services, anything uh, could be very homogenous, you know, availability from area to area. Uh, most internet backbone providers are pretty EMP hard in this day and age, and some of them uh, can be a little more forward thinking even in commercial data centers. Uh, of course, uh, a lot of devices would survive that are just very small, because there is a uh, kind of upper limit on the frequencies that the CMP puts out, and as I said, that's a few gigahertz, so if you have a small enough device, it doesn't really behave like an antenna anymore. And if it's not plugged into, you know, a large power line, which is going to be resonating at, say, uh, you know, somewhere in extremely low frequency range, then that device is more likely to survive. Uh, then, you know, you might just say, well, we haven't had an EMP attack in over the last half century in which we've known about these effects. Is it really something to be concerned over? And I'd say some concerns reasonable, but certainly not panic. Uh, however, the interesting thing I'm going to get to, if I can get this video up here in one second, <laughs> Uh, is this new uranium uh, separation technology. It's in the video, videos folder here, and uh, this, uh, the CEO of Silex Systems actually uh, explains, the, uh, explains it quite well. We can hear. Do we have audio? I guess we might not have audio here. Oh dear. Okay, well I guess we're not getting uh, audio on our videos for now. So we'll just go ahead and skip over. But basically this guy says that they've developed this uh, great new laser enrichment technology in, uh, in Australia and this indeed uh, has been ongoing for the last couple decades and then surprisingly there is a wild proliferation assessment. A lot of people have been calling for a proliferation assessment of third generation laser isotope separation. And one came out, it was published by a uh, postdoc at Princeton named Ryan Snyder, and uh, he essentially said, you know, it looks like this is previously carbon dioxide laser technology, they've probably started working on carbon monoxide laser technology, and that the uh, possibility exists that such a system could be indigenously assembled, which is kind of just code for saying this is not a very hard thing to build. Like, you could get your hands on uranium in theory, and... Uh, Enriching it would, would really no longer be a huge undertaking of nation states making centrifuges, spinning them up at, you know, tens of thousands of RPM. That's really no longer necessary with uh, just gas laser technology. I mean, we're talking relatively simple things you can build out of Marx generators, which are made out of capacitors and spark caps or solid state switches. And, uh, and that's really kind of, you know, switching things up because you don't need that huge capital investment. A lot of non-state actors may be able to indigenously proliferate in the future. And uh, that's why I think we may be looking at kind of a future of arms control failure, at least from the perspective of being able to stop enrichment, because it's difficult to pick up somebody making a laser isotope separation setup versus a medical laser or, you know, just anything that needs a lot of pulse capacitors, for example. 
Uh, so as much as I hate to agree with Donald Trump on the issue of nuclear arms control, I, I think the totality of the evidence may point to uh, being kind of shit creek, for lack of a better term. Granted, there is uh, great progress elsewhere in arms control, like the use for experiment for remotely detecting uh, isotope signatures operating in nuclear reactors. Um, most arms control has really been more around policy of restricting enrichment, but again, that's really going to be a lot harder with, uh, with this Silex process being reverse engineered now. In terms of locating a clandestine proliferation facility, uh, it turns out you only need about 7,200 kilograms of uh, uranium ore in order to proliferate, and the facility might fit in about 200 square meters. So this, this could be very challenging. There really haven't been too many good intelligence solutions out there yet for this. Uh, in addition to the comparatively low upfront capital expenditures, the ability to indigenously assemble laser enrichment facilities really presents a significant operational security advantage for a proliferator versus, uh, say, probing an existing supply chain to find the next AQ Khan, who's you know, dealing centrifuges. Uh, in terms of building a realistic future threat model for uh, potential asymmetric nuclear actors, I think stepping back into the annals of civilian misadventure with energetic materials is really warranted. I mean, you can say for every, you know, Timothy McVeigh, there are 10,000 Jason Pierre Pauls who blow their finger off with fireworks, <laughs> for lack of a better analogy. And I think you'd probably see a lot of similar things if there's uh, indeed a, a surge in nuclear proliferation in the near future. You may see a lot of accidents by would-be proliferators before you see anything that actually, uh, you know, comes to fruition. Uh, you know, in the immortal words of Boris Badenov, you can't make an omelet without breaking some eggs, poopsie. <laughs> So really, in terms of what to do about it, you know, like I said, I think the high-altitude EMP uh, is really the, you know, kind of the most likely threat model, given the really disproportionate uh, kind of effect it can have on a whole society versus, you know, maybe you can affect a few square miles with a ground detonation, you can affect a country with a, a high-altitude EMP. Uh, and believe it or not, shielding is actually not that difficult. You know, you look at like a picture of the Cheyenne Mountain Complex. Well, that was designed to survive a five megaton direct strike. Uh, granted, it's even deprecated now because there are precise enough missiles to hit it over and over and over again that are held by nation states. But when you think about just kind of a, a pot shot coming in, and, you know, exploding at a high altitude, believe it or not, something like a trash can can give you, you know, 40 or 50 decibels of shielding if you tape it up properly so it doesn't act as a slot antenna. And let alone, you know, steel culverts, drainage pipes. Uh, there are really a tremendous amount of options as far as shielding goes. The important thing is just the inside of the shielding it has to be non-electrically conductive, whereas the shielding itself has to be electrically conductive. And then uh, very large devices are going to also need magnetic shielding in addition to just conductive electric shielding. So I decided to look at, you know, some different options for this, and, uh, you know, you can obviously go small like the trash can or whatever, or go ahead and actually, you know, purpose-build a hardened facility, and that's where I looked at uh, MIL-STD-188 and 1251, high-altitude electromagnetic pulse protection. Oh, we got the time? We're done. Okay, shoot. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot. <laughs>